I had a comment. My name is Marilyn Jacobs. I'm a training and supervising psychoanalyst here in Los Angeles. And I think over this whole uh, conference, there's been some questions, some incredulousness about psychoanalysis. And I just want to make the point that psychoanalysis has changed, and it's not your father's psychoanalysis anymore. The way Dr. Kandel was asking about, and I think Ellen and um, Kate, you would probably agree that the, if anybody is interested to really look at what is contemporary psychoanalysis, I think you would see that there's a lot of usefulness about uh, looking at implicit processes versus the explicit uh, attention with cognitive behavioral therapy. And I think uh, in looking at culture, the culture of American psychiatry and medicine has been to just eradicate psychodynamic thinking from most medical centers and research, and I think that's a big problem that our patients would benefit from, from attention to. So I just would ask everybody here, go look on the website of the American Psychoanalytic and the Division of Psychoanalysis of the American Psychological Association. I think you'll be very surprised at what you see in terms of the developments. Thank you very much. I'm going to analyze myself. Today I was even more obnoxious before my analysis. Uh, <laughs> is that unlike Aaron Beck, who took a form of therapy and made it, in a, it, 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 it used it in a way so it could be investigated. He did, did a manual so that you and I can learn to do what he did, did outcome studies. We have not yet reached the point in psychoanalysis where that's been done. So we take it essentially on the basis of individual people's testimony that it works. We don't have medically objectable, uh, objective data that it works. And I think that's coming, but that's what's necessary for the analytic community to do that. Thank you very much, Dr. Kendall. Uh, Dr. Jim? One of the things that's begun to happen in, in this discussion, uh, in part because, Rob, of your marvelous film is, is a is something that hasn't happened quite enough, I think, of a discussion back and forth between the cultural and and the um, biological and clinical. And I wonder if we, if, if for instance, some of the clinicians um, or biologists who watched Rob's film, um, seems to me that that uh, at least, uh, and and but but perhaps also Ellen would talk uh, about like sort of what your reaction was to that film. What, what you saw in it. And I have immediately like sort of two thoughts. One is, is how we understand of those persons who are at risk from childhood and from biological, who actually develops the illness. That, of course, was Dr. Cannon's major question throughout. Um, and how looking cross-culturally might help us understand that process. And the second thing that it was very interesting that, that Ellen said, no, I'm, that, that you don't use the language of recovery, um, though there's a whole kind of recovery movement, et cetera. But obviously, on the other hand, um, even if, or if perhaps much better, we take your language of, rec of regaining your life. And there is a way in which one can say Pat Kreta rec regained his life. He didn't quote recover or whatever that might mean, but he regained his life. And whether we can, what we can learn in these kinds of extremely different kinds of cultural and social contexts about, about and, and learn empirically about how people recover their lives. Thanks. How about uh, Dr. Cannon? I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at, at a cross-cultural analysis of, of uh, you know, mechanisms of conversion, say, or predictors of conversion. Um, the first thing to say is that we we know very little empirically about that, of course. Uh, although there's there's a there's a nice bit of work. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I wasn't here yesterday, but I think it was alluded to as, as having been mentioned yesterday on um, urbanicity, immigrant populations, particularly Afro-Caribbean into the UK, um, uh, high background rates of uh, access to illicit substances, including cannabis. Uh, all of these things could be defined in cultural, uh, social, cultural terms, and they do appear to be factors influencing risk for uh, disorder. How how they operate as triggers or not is is not as clear, and there's there's a lot of ambiguity about the cannabis effect, whether it is is a 
a cause or a consequence or you know an early marker uh, of, of, of a process that isn't determined by the cannabis use, but it's, it's an indicator that that process is present. Um, so, so I don't think we've fully worked out causality. Um, and and in for, the, for the more contextual level risk factors, of course, it's even harder to make a, a strong case about those impinging on a single uh, or, or a specific mechanism. Although I think Paul's point, I would I actually agree a lot with, 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 with what he was saying, that, that we should be at least vigilant for the possibility that many of these risk factors do operate through some limited subset of spinal column pathways. Uh, inflammation, inflammatory response to stress being one of the main ideas in that regard. But as part of that same cascade, there's the recruitment of neurotrophins, right, which, uh, which is, is, is part of the neuroprotective response to stress. And I think there's pretty solid evidence from prenatal serum type work that uh, people who develop schizophrenia later in life uh, fail to mount the same degree of neuroprotective response uh, to, to, to stressors. In this case, it was, it was fetal oxygen deprivation, but it could, it could work for other stressors. So, so I think if we, if we start lining up, I mean, cultural level mechanisms are transduced into effects on the nervous system. And, and you know, so there's this kind of bi-directional causality there that one wants to be vigilant to, and it's models like that that perhaps would give us some ability to uh, uh, get traction on that. Yeah, a, a couple, couple of things. One is, um, when I looked at the movie, it was a very moving, compelling movie. The, the commonality I felt was that the core is terror and fear. You know, and it manifests with different scary beliefs depending on the culture. And the other important thing was how important relationship was. He had people who stood by him, who were willing to accept, you know, his eccentricities, if you can call them that. So that was important. As for the recovery movement, I, I actually, I don't think I will ever recover fully. Um, I, but I think I like the movement, and I take it to stand for two particular principles. One is that it should be, pa what, what the desired outcome should be should be patient-driven, and people should take charge of their care and their recovery, and also that we should be concerned with more than just symptoms, but again, quality of life. And I like those two factors. Okay, yes, right. Up here in the middle, please. Go ahead, Roberto, go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Luis Fernandez. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, it's been wonderful to see the evolution of Facreta's story. I've seen it in different phases from writing to film. Um, and in this, uh, in this version, I'm curious about your take on this point and uh, other members of the group. Um, one point that was made more strongly in the, 1960 the, the movie that yeah. focused on the events of 1965 was the change, the, uh, the relative opening that happened in understanding Pacoretta's story, as I understood the previous film, with the fall of the Suharto regime in 1999. And it, it became suddenly possible to talk a, a little bit, a little bit more maybe, about things that had been hidden. And uh, I wondered what sort of uh, effect the, uh, that uh, change in the sociocultural context in which the illness was evolving and being understood affected not only the course of his improvement or, or not, and also the understanding of what actually is the phenomenology of the illness and the causation of the illness. Yeah, it's something we certainly haven't talked about much, which is more really macro questions of the relationship between, you know, personal experience and, and, and symptoms and symptom progression and larger historical events and political events. Um, for those who are unaware of, you know, which probably most of you have modern Indonesian history, when Suharto fell after 32 years, this open, opened Indonesian society up to this, um, to forms of remembering and recovering memory. Um, this, you know, memory takes place in a, in a, so, in a social context, and for 30 years, the, this mass killing, this million people were killed, could not be discussed in any way, shape, or form. Husbands didn't talk to wives. Uh, parents didn't talk to children. Pop Freitha never told anyone, even though um, the killers were his neighbors. Uh, we refer to that. And then they, they, become, they became internalized in these forms of these, if we want to see it as hallucinations of spirits. Um, so it was only that large historical opening sparked by global macroeconomic change that allowed his own personal experience to be narrated 
and I think, um, you know, even though I'm a psychological anthropologist, um, I, I'm staying a little bit away from making those sort of psychological connections between that and, and the progression of his illness, though I, I do think there was some sort of cathartic element. Um, and uh, again, we don't want to take, as psychological anthropologists, we're not psychoanalysts, we're not psychotherapists, even though some of us, some of us are jointly uh, uh, trained in both. Um, I think there was a therapeutic element to our discussions over the years. Um, we certainly, uh, he, he, he was allowed to narrate not just the history of 65 and what had happened and these uh, uh, human rights abuses and massacres of very close people, um, uh, but also the other tragedies in his life and the other, you know, in some ways, stressors. Um, and I think, I think that was helpful. Though, you know, this is obviously this is not scientific, it's purely anecdotal. Um, but uh, I think we, we always need to, in, in our work, we need to attend to those, those larger macro structural features. You know, and sometimes they very much fade into the woodwork if we're not attending to them. Okay, um, actually, I think it's probably best that we close at this time so that we give the audience an opportunity to rest come back in a half hour. I want to thank the wonderful speakers, the video presentation, and also the audience.